pay our bills and that the government stays open. Well, according to a recent article by our next guest, this budget is unveiled at a time when 1 percent of the people in the United States take in nearly a quarter of the nation's income. Of the 1 percent, by the 1 percent, for the 1 percent. That's the title of an article by Joe Stiglitz, appearing in this month's issue of Vanity Fair. The piece discusses growing equalities, inequalities in the United States. Joseph Stiglitz is a Nobel Prize-winning economist, professor at Columbia University, author of numerous books, most recently, Freefall, America, Free Markets, and the Sinking of the World Economy. Welcome to Democracy Now! Nice to be here. Um, so, of the 1 percent, by the 1 percent, for the 1 percent. Explain. Well, the point is that there has been this growing inequality, uh, not only in income, but actually the inequality of wealth is even uh, much greater. There's a shrinking of opportunity. It's not just that the people at the top are getting richer. Uh, if, if they were doing getting richer because they were contributing more to our society and everybody else was doing well, that'd be one thing. But actually, they're gaining and everybody else is decreasing. Uh, in fact, right now, it's not just the bottom, but even the middle, the middle, the median income, half above, half below, are poorer today than they were more than a decade ago. So all the growth that has occurred in our country over the last decade or more has gone to the upper 1, 2 percent. Uh, at the same time, there's really shrinking opportunity. You know, we used to think of the United States as the land of opportunity, Horatio Alger, anybody can make it. And we used to think of ourselves as different from old Europe, as we used to call it. But the statistics show otherwise. Now, yes, we have some dramatic examples of people making it from the bottom to the top, middle to the top. But the statistics look at, you know, what happens on average? What is the chance of somebody at the bottom making it to the middle or the middle making it to the top? And right now, we are worse than old Europe. This is something dramatic that has happened over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, and what's really happened is old Europe has become more of a land of opportunity. Uh, they reformed their education systems after World War II. Uh, they, they, they said that they had, they recognized they had a problem, and they changed. Meanwhile, in the United States, we've wound up with a more fractionated society, uh, one where more, move more to a private education system, uh, where those who have money can get a really first class education, but the average American is not. And, the, you know, those who come out of those education statistics that came out not long ago were, show that, on average, Americans are doing more poorly than countries uh, around the world. And, wait, this is related uh, to, to some of the issues that got uh, raised in the context of the financial crisis. And remember the discussion about the bonuses? Mm -hmm. And that's related to the same idea. The question was, if people were getting rewards for contributing to our society, uh, we, a theory that was in the 19th century called marginal productivity theory, then you can say, okay, those who contribute more should get more. But what we saw in that crisis was that these titans of the financial industry got mega bonuses while their companies were making mega losses, and while they were, as a result of their actions, our economy and the global economy went in to a, a real tailspin from which we have still not recovered. Well, Their salaries have recovered, but not the rest of us. Well, Joe Stiglitz, given this trend, as you say, it's been going on now for decades, we've been startled in the last few months by Democrats at both the national level and some state or the local levels uh, further uh, increasing the bonanza uh, of this 1 percent. We had, obviously, uh, in Congress the uh, extension of the Bush-era tax cuts for the wealthy that were supposed to be eliminated. And here in New York State, we were startled for the, that the new Democratic governor, uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, abolished a millionaire's tax that had been instituted a few years earlier, uh, so that on, in both ends, if you are if you are a, multi, a multi-millionaire in New York State, you benefit benefited from both the federal policies as well as the recent state policies. So uh, the Democrats are supposed to be, to some degree, the party of labor. 
What they're doing, they, they, let me just be clear, they are better than the Republican positions. Uh, and they, they, some of them have fought against these tax cuts for the millionaires. But to me, this makes absolutely no sense. You know, we're big discussion you were talking about earlier about the budget deficit. Uh, there are only two ways to address the budget deficit raise revenues or cut spending. And with this 1 percent getting so much, there's only one place, really, to get that extra revenue. The good news is it's relatively easy. You have 25 percent, almost 25 percent of the income in the upper 1 percent. You raise their taxes by a few percentage points, and you get an awful lot of money. And in many of these cases, we don't even have to raise the taxes. All we have to do is to say they ought to pay a fair tax rate. One of the curious things, and again, this is bipartisan, we lower the tax rates on speculators so that speculators pay a much lower tax rate than people who work for a living. Now, is there any principle in economics that says that you should earn more money by speculating than by working hard? To me, it makes no sense. So eliminating some of these special tax provisions would raise a lot of revenue and improve our, 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 uh, our deficit position. And this raises a, a, a very important point that I raised in my article, which is that much of the wealth of this 1 percent comes not from hard work, uh, not from innovation, but from good investments in Washington investing in political capital. And you saw that in the financial sector, where they first got deregulation and they got a massive bailout. But it's true in lots of other areas. Uh, uh, a lot of the natural resource companies, mining, oil, get access to natural resources that are in public lands at a discount price. So if you can buy—if you can get access to these resources at a very low price, sell them at a high price, you make a lot of money. It's actually like money being stolen from the public. Uh, I wanted to ask you about a, another um, uh, something else you've written about, the connection in terms of risk analysis uh, uh, between the, the nuclear crisis uh, in Japan and the meltdown of the reactors there uh, and the credit default swaps. And I would even throw in perhaps the BP blowout, <laughs> which was another example of a, a risk analysis that said it could never happen. Yeah. Well, I, I just wrote an interesting article making a comparison between the, the, our ability to judge what are called small probability events, fat, you know, uh, rare events that are supposed to be rare. Those in the financial market said that the kind of collapse that we had should happen once in a thousand years, once in the history of the universe. But we had a collapse in the 1980s. We had a problem in the 1990s. We have them every 10 years. And that shows the models are very bad. Our ability to judge rare events is very bad. Now, a lot of research in, in behavioral economics and psychology have explained why it is that these events that don't happen very much, we don't have a lot of experience. But one of the points that I raised was that these people have an incentive not to see things accurately. You know, the, the, the nuclear power industry has an incentive to tell everybody, oh, don't worry, nothing, uh, no risk there. Uh, the, the financial sector had a, a, an incentive to say, don't worry about these derivatives, even if they're already a quadrillion dollars. Uh, don't worry, because we can manage that risk. We have systems of diversifying the risk across the economy. Clearly wrong. So, you know, when there's so much money at stake, people have a way of seeing, of discounting these risks, especially because those risks are borne by everybody else in our society. And, you know, nuclear power is a really interesting case, because that industry has never been commercially viable. It has always existed on the back of a government-provided insurance that we provide for the, as taxpayers that they don't pay for. And we see now in Japan that, you know, they did the same thing, and we see the cost of that. The rest of society is paying an enormous price. There is no way that the slight savings in, in energy costs 
can make up for the loss to the Japanese economy that has resulted from the nuclear explosion. And the same thing could happen here in the United States. I love saying and meet the press right after the tsunami and the earthquake and the terrible tragedy in Japan. Um, they had on the head of the Nuclear Energy Institute, so you know, they represent the nuclear industry, and the uh, uh, host of the show saying, thank you so much for running in at the last minute to be here with us. And I could only think about, I mean, here he is uh, speaking to save the butts of the nuclear industry in this country um, and saying there is nothing to worry about here, um, as we're seeing this, um, well, what is looking like a partial meltdown or more. If the industry really believed it, let them make an unlimited liability and provide us with a guarantee that they would pick up for the financial cost of the kind of disaster that Japan is facing. And I can tell you that if you made them bear those costs, if we didn't give them that free ride of limited liability that industry would not exist in the United States today. In your piece, Joe Stiglitz and Vanity Fair, of the 1 percent by the 1 percent for the 1 percent, you say, Americans have been watching protests against oppressive regimes that concentrate massive wealth in the hands of an elite few. Yet in our own democracy, 1 percent of the people take nearly a quarter of the nation's income, and inequality, even the wealthy, will come to regret. Uh, talk about all this. We're seeing these rolling rebellions. We are seeing rebellions, not only in the Middle East, though, in the Midwest. I mean, look at Madison. In Wisconsin. And what about this issue of even the wealthy will regret this? Well, there are two points that I try to make. One is that a successful economy requires collective action. There are lots of things we have to do together. We have to have infrastructure, we have to have an educated population. Uh, if you have a divided society, you start uh, worrying more if you're in the wealthy and you have a electric system that can use your wealth to affect the politics, you say, I'd rather have a small government that isn't able to redistribute money, take money away from me. I don't need public schools. I have private money. I don't need public parks. I have private—you know, my, my large uh, land. So what you have, then, is an erosion of the kind of collective action, and that makes a society less efficient, less productive. And you see that already happening. We are competing in education with, with countries in Asia that were much poorer than we were not that long ago. So that's one problem. And the second one is that, obviously, a, 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 um, you know, a house divided <laughs> can't stand, that you start getting tensions, uh, you start uh, not paying attention to the things that make us cohesive as a nation. And that's what you're seeing in, in Wisconsin. Uh, and you also see that in, in the budget messages that are coming across, like saying, OK, we're going to cut back on health care for the aged and for the poor, but we're not going to do anything about overall health care costs. What does that mean? It means that if you're going to cut back on health expenditures for the aged and the poor, and you're going to let health costs continue to rise, that says rationing. They're not going to be able to get health care. Already, we spend more money with poor health outcomes than those in other countries in the advanced industrial world. And it's going to get worse as the poor and the elderly can't get access to health care. In that vein, I wanted to ask you about a recent dissent of yours uh, that a uh, a bunch of uh, eminent uh, economists, of chair, former chairman of the President's Council on Economic Advisors and other members were asked to sign on to a letter about the need for deficit redu reduction in the future in the United States. Why did you dissent and, uh, to that letter? Well, it, it, the 